Hello, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are in the world. I hope you can hear me now. I'm Dr. Macmillan, President of Doctors Federation for the World. And in preparation for our upcoming conference on the 11th and 14th of November, we have been having a number of interviews that are building towards this global virtual conference where we're focused on a number of things around COVID-19 and the diseases that are associated with it. We're focused on a number of pillars and we'll be sharing more information about that conference in the next few weeks as we continue to build towards it. And as part of that process, we have, as usual with me, Dr. Shankara Shetty. And I'll ask you, uh, Shankara, if you can unmute your mic um, for me. Um, I, I can't, oops. I think we've lost Dr. Shetty temporarily. I think we're having some Wi-Fi issues in South Africa. But um, once he comes back, we'll be able to share some um, ideas with him. The other person that we've got, I think I've got uh, Shankara back again. Are you there again, Shankara? Yes, Philip, uh, can you hear me? I'm hearing you now. So I'll just ask you to do a quick hello to everyone as, as, as usual. And, um, and let us, um, as we prepare for this conference, I was saying, that as we move towards the conference and the, the virtual approach with regards to looking at COVID-19 diseases around COVID-19, the pillars that we're focused on, Doctors' Federation is looking to bring healthcare to the forefront for everyone. So uh, I'll just ask you to say a quick hello to everyone, Shankara. Uh, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, everyone. I'm Dr. Shankara Cherry, a frontline doctor, natural science biologist, and general practitioner, and the vice president at Doctors Federation for the World. Uh, welcome, welcome to our broadcast. Excellent. Thank you very much, Shankara. And today we're talking about autopsies in regard to COVID-19. This is an area that had significant interest to me for some time. And so I reached out um, to a pathologist, Dr. Wargox, um, who gave me some valuable answers, couldn't be with us today. But we've got with us Dr. Rory Donelligan, and I'll ask him to introduce himself. You're muted at the moment, Rory. And um, thank you. I'll just ask you to do a quick introduction before we start discussing some of the points around autopsies and so on in relation to uh, COVID-19 and what's been happening. So if, if you could just introduce yourself, Rory. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Rory Donlin, yeah. Um, I'm a, uh, a medical doctor who then specialized, uh, took five years specializing in anatomical pathology. Uh, which included autopsies. We basically did autopsies for the first six months of our training. Um, it was, uh, you know, a very important part of the training back then. But uh, unfortunately, nowadays it's become, uh, you know, uh, less prevalent in training, which I think has hampered uh, anatomical pathology training. So uh, after I, I qualified as a, a anatomical pathologist here in um, in KwaZulu Natal, South Africa. Um, I did a short stint in private practice, and then I went over to Seattle, Washington, where I did uh, subspecialty training in neuropathology, which included uh, the brain, eyes, uh, muscles, and nerves. Um, I did that just for 14 months uh, before I was recruited to Queensland, Australia, and I worked there as a pathologist for 17 years. Um, you know, did, did some registrar training in Fiji. And then a short stint uh, in Vanuatu, seven months before returning uh, to my home in uh, KwaZulu-Natal, South Africa. Excellent. And I just want to, I think there are some things that people won't grasp. When you said that you were in uh, Australia, I'm going to show the map because people don't have any idea as to Vanuatu, where that is in the context of Australia. So. Here I have an image of Australia. And so you were in Brisbane, weren't you? Yeah, in the Brisbane area, in the greater Brisbane so area. You were in the Brisbane area of Australia, and you were there for 17 years. And yeah. then around the COVID-19 pandemic time, was this before or after the pandemic started? Um, no, this was actually uh, during the pandemic um, in Queensland. But uh, when I went to Vanuatu, there were no cases of COVID there. At the time, ah, so this is we Vanuatu, just, yes. And so, is it? It's not part of the Fiji Islands, then, is it? Um, no, it's a, it's a separate country of 
it's a, it's a, it's actually a chain of 80 islands. Yeah. Uh, 80 something islands. I think it might be 88 islands in total. Yes. Um, and it's, uh, you know, it's a separate country. It's, I see. Uh, and, and what were you there for? Why did you leave Australia? I mean, Brisbane to go there. Um, well, we were going to try and, uh, help set up a histopathology, uh, laboratory in Vanuatu because there was none at the time. And I yes. think there's still, there still isn't one. We're still in the process of, of sending equipment from, from Brisbane. Um, so our purpose there was to set up histopathology for those islands and also some neighboring islands, such as the Solomon Islands, which, which, which don't have much of a service. So that was our aim there. Excellent, excellent. So yes, so what, what I wanted to do when I had asked Dr. Wargatz, and he so kindly gave some answers, yeah, so he had written them down for me, and I just wanted to go through some of the points that, um, that he had made. And one of the first questions that I had asked him was this simple one here, why is pathological examination the foundation of Western medicine? And his response was about cellular adaptation to insult injury, inflammation, mood healing, neoplasia. These are the foundations of pathology. And thus the application of this knowledge to diagnose disease in humans and animals is dependent on pathological examination of human tissue and corporal substances. Now that's quite a, a, a good overview of it, isn't it? Um, what would what would you say, Rory? Uh, no, I would agree with that. Um, you know, uh, the autopsy is a is a full examination, both external and all the internal organs, including histology. When we take a biopsy, you know, it's only a small piece of tissue. Uh, could be from the skin, could be from the brain. But it's hard to extrapolate from a biopsy or a blood sample what's happening in the entire body. But when you have an autopsy, you're looking at the entire body, you can see the entirety of the process, whether it's localized inflammation or whether it's generalized, um, you can see the full picture at the time the person died. So it does, um, you know, it, it does provide very useful information that no other tool that no other tool in our armamentarium can yeah that's that's very true and even you shankara you know you had to do autopsies i had to do autopsies as, as part of the the training did you enjoy it uh, it's not something you'd enjoy philip but it's something that brings all the pathology to the fore and uh, it gets you to see the pathology you learn about and uh, like like rory said seeing the entirety of the human body you can follow up. So if you find some some sort of liver pathology and are suspicious it arose somewhere else, you can go and investigate that further. Uh, so it gives you a nice broad understanding of how pathology evolves. Uh, it's not just a single specimen and you're trying to draw inference from a small piece of tissue. So autopsies are vitally important. And of course, we have the history behind the demise of that patient. So it brings a lot of the uh, history, the presenting factors, and the death of that patient into a good focus. And it gives yeah. us good understanding of patho pathophysiologic process. Yeah. I, I'm going to ask uh, what seems like a simple question, Rory, but I, I think that not everybody will understand this. But it, in a very short summary, when you are doing an autopsy, what are the general steps? Because people hear about it, they've, they've seen some of it on like uh, NCA, you know, some kind of crime shows and so on. But the, the process, how long does it take? You know, um, do you have to cut through the whole body to examine all the organs? Could you just give us a, a general idea as to what that process is like? Okay, well, the, the first step, we usually uh, get all the hospital notes and, uh, you know, generally the, uh, the, we, we try and get all the notes the day before or sometime before we actually perform the autopsy. We go carefully through the hospital notes. We get any of the imaging that's been done, any ancillary tests. So we have a full picture um, of the clinical impression. And then um, after we've made a summary of the clinical impression, um, that usually the next day we would commence the autopsy, which would start with an external examination of the body, you know, front, sides, and back. 
and then we would and then we would uh, you know commence dissection um, uh, basically very long incision um, and then you know examine the internal organs obviously at the time of autopsy it's a, a macroscopic examination it's with the naked eye can use a, a magnifying glass or other magnifying tool at the time of the autopsy um, but then um, you know based on what we see with the naked eye uh, we would take sections small sections for histology of selected areas but we would try and sample as widely as possible um, honing in on particular lesions that are visible to the naked eye but then also taking standard sections from areas that maybe don't look abnormal to the naked eye these would then be fixed in formalin they would be processed on a tissue processor which involves you know a, maybe a bit more formalin fixation dehydration and alcohol removing of fats in xylene and then impregnating the tissue with paraffin wax and uh, from there we have a wax block that uh, is basically a, a permanent record these these wax blocks can be kept for hundreds of years even still today they're used for research purposes from you know uh, over 100 years ago um, and uh, from those wax blocks we would then cut very thin sections using a microtome these are sections cut at six uh, thousandths of a millimeter um, and then we would stain those up and look under the microscope so we would we would we would start with the clinical history from from all the notes from all the imaging then we would do the macroscopic examination which involves all the organs of the body um, and you know some uh, some organs may be retained for uh, you know uh, more expert processing like uh, the brain either you would cut the brain at the time of doing the autopsy or you could fix it in formalin and cut it at a later date when you have experts there like neuropathologists um, so you'd have the clinical history the macroscopic examination and then the microscopic examination of all the sections that you took at the time of autopsy and then fixed cut stained and examined microscopically and then your so your final autopsy r report would rely on all those three steps including extensive microscopic examination of both abnormal looking areas as well as normal areas of the body excellent yeah that's a great summary thank you very much rory so i'm going to be using that understanding and i'm going to ask shankara a question with regards to this so shankara what was your thought when the COVID-19 pandemic started, did you assume that we were still continuing or increasing those autop autopsies on patients who died of COVID-19? What were your thoughts, Shankara? Uh, <clears throat> Philip, the autopsy findings would have been an invaluable source of information that would, given a, would have given us some understanding of pathophysiology and helped us to direct uh, treatment. But uh, of course, there was a paucity of that. I think uh, the lack of early autopsies was uh, a big problem with the pandemic. We had to examine patients and look at treatment outcomes to project as to possible little physiologies, underlying pathophysiology. That made it difficult to actually gauge appropriate treatment interventions. So the autopsies, the histology, the macro and microscopic findings would have been invaluable in helping treat patients that were critically ill. Uh, so I think I think we, we we had a scarcity of that at the start of the pandemic, for whatever reasons uh, they were. I think that the, the reason I asked you that question, Shankar, is that genuinely I thought that this was done, being done, and actually being done an act, at an accelerated rate in the context of the pandemic because you would have had these patients dying of COVID-19. My assumption was that literally almost every COVID-19 patient who died would have had full detailed autopsies. Rory, was that a, a false assumption by us as clinicians and even the public? Uh, yes, yes, definitely so. I'm afraid that was uh, a false assumption. Um, yeah, I think... Um, I think the dangers of the virus were exaggerated early on 
Um, you know, the, the autopsies are discouraged in, in certain diseases like uh, Ebola virus, for instance, where there could be a, you know, a risk to the pathologist and the mort mortuary staff. So in a case of like, say, Ebola virus, maybe you just take a liver biopsy or, 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 or some very limited uh, examination of the organs. But this was not the case with COVID. Um, and uh, I think maybe the risks were, were exaggerated. For, um, I'm not sure why doctors were not more interested, especially pathologists, to learn more and why. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure the, the reasons, but uh, unfortunately, postmortems were, were not uh, done in the numbers that should have been done to learn more about this disease. Uh, it was one of the questions I put to Dr. Wargotz, and he, he managed to find one of the debunking theories that came out from the WHO, which says COVID-19, WHO prohibits autopsies, and that was false. And what they were saying was that essentially that they didn't have any issue with, with autopsies, but the guidance was that procedures must be performed in an adequately ventilated room that means one with at least natural ventilation or negative pressure rooms using mechanical ventilation. And I know I'd spoken to another pathologist who said that in most places, it, well, natural ventilation would mean that you could open all the windows, I guess, and mm. negative pressure rooms are not that common. Is, is that about right? Um, yeah, yes, that would be correct. Um... Uh, in Africa, adequate ventilation does mean you just open the windows. Um, but um, in other parts of the world, they, they had very they had very good facilities. After the uh, you know mad cow outbreak in in Britain, a lot of the uh, autopsies were upgraded to include laminar flow. They had laminar flow in them. The you know the autopsy facilities. They had the most magnificent autopsy facilities. That, so there was no reason why autopsies could not be done there. So, and this is where the issue comes, Shankara, with regards to one of the questions, because sometimes we get into these conspiracy theories, Shankara. And so the impression could have been on social media that this is being blocked by major organizations. And I'm, I'm trying to, if they were trying to protect the interest of pathologists and they were saying, don't do it unless you have clear, adequate, safe, appropriate facilities. Um, don't do it. it. Is that unreasonable, Shankara? Look, I don't think it's unreasonable, Philip, but I think we've got to look at the pathogen itself. We had doctors in hospitals wearing hazmat suits and treating patients, and that is at the most uh, infectious point in the evolution of a virus. So when you're looking at a patient that's demised, taking the same kind of protective measures are actually more than adequate uh, to to examine autopsy, to do autopsies. So I think uh, there was a there was fear around uh, the the potential for infection amongst pathologists, like the fear amongst uh, doctors in treating patients out of hospital, and that uh, that that uh, uh, had negative effect on the pandemic itself. So uh, yes, uh, here in South Africa, people were barred from funerals. We had uh, caskets being wrapped in pl plastic cling wrap to prevent spread, limiting the numbers of people to those funerals. So I think the presiding fear was uh, a, a great cause of the lack of autopsies amongst pathologists being afraid to actually undertake autopsies. Mm. And, and so the question then becomes, I mean, there's one thing when you have a new disease, nobody quite knows what is going on. How long is reasonable for us to then assess the situation and then reassess what we're doing? Now, we're looking at hindsight now, but what would you have thought if we then faced another virus? How long would it be considered to be the time frame you would expect for us to assess it and say, actually, this is OK, as opposed to this is not OK? This has technically gone on now for two and a half to three years almost, so let's say two and a half years, what would be a fair assessment for a reassessment of the decision? Any thoughts on that, Rory? 
Well, as I say, in some of these state-of-the-art, uh, you know, uh, mortuaries that they have in uh, Europe and America, um, autopsies could have been done from the get-go. They, you know, they have um, very advanced facilities in other parts of the world. I mean, we did in Seattle. When I went to, I, I went to do the British exams and I was sent to Manchester, to the Manchester Royal Infirmary. They, uh you know, they, they had such a highly sophisticated mortuary with this laminar flow and everything that I, I didn't, coming from Africa, I, I didn't know all the gadgets they had. You know, the shower, the, the shower, and the, 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 the water that was continually running over the body and, and, and all these gadgets. And I, I accidentally turned on the shower and showered the examiners <laughs> while, I, while I was doing the autopsy because I, I, I wasn't familiar with exactly how, how um, high tech um, you know these facilities were so I think there there were facilities to commence autopsies immediately. Mm. You know um, there there was the risk didn't justify them. Maybe in 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 uh, in African places like that, but in the high powered facilities that they have in America and, and Europe, uh, there was there was no need to delay. So so here is a question, Shankara, that was just popped into my head. Here we have a pandemic. Clinicians are going to manage patients who clearly have COVID-19. Sometimes early in the pandemic, we didn't have the full hazmat suits and so on. If we could do that with patients who clearly had COVID-19, is it fair to protect the pathologists from giving us the answers that we need? Any, any thoughts on that? Uh, definitely not, Philip. Uh, as a frontline doctor who took the opportunity to see every patient physically from the start of the pandemic, I was taking a huge risk. And I needed the ancillary services around me to provide quick understanding so that I could protect not only myself, but my community. So I, I, if you look at the pandemic, the frontline doctors were at the highest risk. So you can't throw the frontline doctors out to the wolves without having the rest of the scientific community around you to actually lend some insight to what you're actually dealing with. Yes, the reason I did that was to gain information, to gain understanding, and that's what we want from autopsies. So early on in the pandemic, we should have had all the scientific arsenal that we have at, its, uh, at full speed. Yes, uh, we, as we developed or understood uh, the, the science behind it, and if it showed anything sinister, we could redirect. Now, when you talk of how quickly it should have taken us to understand that we're not dealing with a pathogen that is as contagious or virulent as we first suspected, as a frontline doctor, I think after the first month and a half of seeing patients, having, and not picking up COVID, I realized that I'm reasonably well protected with ventilation and sunlight. But of course, uh, that's not what the rest of the world said. It's two years down the line, and we're still talking about the contagiousness of the virus and how to avoid contact with it. Mm. Yeah, very good point. And, and Rory, I'm beginning to wonder. I, I, one of the links that was sent by Dr. Wargox was the importance of uh, toxin numbers declining. I'll make this a little bit um, bigger so you can see. Importance of our toxins de declining amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. And one of the points in this that it highlighted that was actually between 1972 and 94, the rate declined from 19.1 to 9.4%. And it continued to decline over the next nine years in this is in the USA as well as globally. It is, what is happening in the context as why is autopsy not considered to be so valuable? Is it that we're shifting our skill set? I think we've just temporarily lost Rory. But um, Shankara, you see what I mean? That trend is going down. It's almost as if the COVID-19 pandemic had exacerbated what was a natural trend where we stopped doing autopsies. I think, Philip, uh, there's a multitude of uh, factors that played into that. Uh, early on, a lot of it was new, and so autopsies were warranted to gain that information. But once we, once we know the reasons behind a patient's demise, there's no reason to then go and do an autopsy on that patient. We have the 
we have the understanding from previous autopsies to fall back on and rely on. Uh, mm. As well, I think there's a psychosocial issue that uh, you've got to get consent to do an autopsy. Uh, the only autopsies that get done without consent are those of unnatural deaths. Uh, and so, yes, for, for a patients' families to agree to an autopsy has become more and more difficult. Uh, so that, that plays into it as well. But I think uh, with, with an increase in unnatural deaths around the world, uh, autopsies should have been performed. You should have expected an increase in trend. But I think uh, the other uh, arms of pathology have lent, lent to our understanding of the causes of death. Uh, mm -hmm. With COVID itself, uh, seeing that it's a new a pandemic, a new virus that we're dealing with, it should have been considered an unnatural death to die of COVID. And we yeah. should have insisted on autopsies getting done early on. We would have got information early on, and then we didn't need to do autopsy on, autopsies on every single person. We would have had the information we needed early on, and then we could have, we could have tapered off and looked specifically at where the gaps lay. Yeah. And uh, uh, this, this is where I think the failing is. Uh, what I've been asking, Rory, just before we temporarily okay. lost you, was the, the trend is going down for doing autopsies across the world. Has COVID just exacerbated what was a natural trend anyway, just made it harder for it to be done? Yes, I do believe so. It, it has been a trend for a number of years that uh, autopsy numbers uh, in, in the hospitals were, were declining. Obviously, this is not the case with the forensic facilities, which where autopsies are required, where, where, where criminal, um, criminal activity is suspected. Um, but yeah, on the importance of autopsies, I just wanted to mention the, um, you know, the Svetlovsk. I don't know if you know about the Svetlovsk anthrax outbreak. I think that occurred in Russia in, in 1979. Um, a, a Russian pathologist was actually instrumental in exposing that whole outbreak because she noticed these, these people coming in with bilateral hemorrhagic pneumonia. And she remembered from her training in, uh, in her early medical train, uh, you know, early uh, pathology training that uh, bilateral hemorrhagic pneumonia was uh, a, uh, you know, a hallmark of anthrax. So she was the one who raised the alarm about this anthrax um, based on the studies. And then they, they basically traced all the cases, all the, all, the, all the deaths were downwind of this abandoned bioweapons facility when, when the Soviet Union uh, you know, uh, partially collapsed. They abandoned some of their bioweapons facilities, and this was one that had been abandoned. And uh, you know, basically downwind of that uh, facility um, the anthrax deaths were occurring, and this was a pathologist, um, you know, uh, uh, not working in a in a in a high biohazards uh, mortuary, just an you know an average mortuary that uh, that highlighted the disease. And I mean, other studies have shown, uh, you know, I think there was a, um, a study from Germany that showed the discrepancy between the clinical and the pathology in about fifty one percent of cases. The clinical mm -hmm. picture. And the pathology, in some cases, very major discrepancies, and we've seen that at autopsy. Um, when uh, you know, back in the day, the the treating surgeon or the treating physician was actually expected to be at the autopsy if their patient had died. Um, you know, to to see the discrepancies that resulted, and in some cases, there were major discrepancies that we saw. Cases where they were just, uh, you know, where the, the clinical impression was of metastatic cancer. When they came to autopsy, it was clear that it was tuberculosis. Um, so things like that. Um, they, you know, uh, so they are, they are very valuable tools. They should have been used early on. Um, yeah, you know, it's a bit of a blight on us pathologists that this did not happen. Yeah, so it, it raises the question, you know, Rory, and I'm, I'm going to ask you this question again, this point. Uh, I, I assumed you know, I, I just assume because I was curious about COVID-19 at the start. I, you know, I, I don't work in respiratory or, or anything, but I just wanted to research it because I was curious about it. Mm. I just can't understand why across the world, where are the curious pathologists? There must have been some. 
who were just interested in doing autopsies on patients mm -hmm. who died of COVID-19 and just want to see exactly what's happening in the lung. What happened there? I think some of them were actually discouraged, you know, um, and I, when I when I was in Vanuatu, uh, I wanted to do autopsies on those who had died shortly after um, COVID vaccination, uh, particularly the younger people, um, and I was actively discouraged there from pursuing that. They basically said the facilities are only for those where criminal uh, behaviour is a, a strong suspicion. And if that's not the case, well, we really don't have the manpower to, con you know, to, to look at this. So, so, so that, um, yeah, that, that, the... that, yeah, it, it raises an important question, you know, and, and Shankara, even thinking about that point, because you've, you've mentioned an important point, Rory, and part of what I had been looking for and still are looking for are any autopsies on people who have been vaccinated now we have had over 12 billion almost 13 billion doses i wanted to see whether or not the pathology at cause of death as you said mirrors what we expect shankara what what are your thoughts on that would is that an expectation is that unreasonable i think it's very reasonable philip we're dealing with a new technology uh, so any uh, death that has proximity to a vaccination should have been considered an unusual death and should have been investigated thoroughly. Uh, that would have given us understanding of any adverse events, any problems we might expect from vaccination itself. So with uh, that many billion doses given to a global population, I would have expected seeing the rise in deaths from vaccination, that we would have had far more autopsies done and had a far better understanding of how the vaccine being a novel technology is actually influencing pathophysiology and causing the demise of these patients. Uh, that is vitally important in going forward. Uh, vaccines have very long-term effects that could manifest 15 to 20 years after the vaccination. And understanding the immediate uh, pathology around uh, adverse events or side effects is vitally important in us projecting and understanding how future illness will present and actually preventing that. So I think it, it, was, it, was a, it is a, completely, uh, a complete uh, failure of uh, scientific rigor in understanding the clinical trials that are being uh, done around the world uh, in understanding side effects. It is a new technology. We don't understand the complexities of it. And every death proximate to a vaccination should have been closely examined, very closely examined. Yeah, so so Rory, and, and let me ask you now. So imagine that I go to a, a major international histopathology conference. There are pathologists from across the world. And I am asking each one of them, you know, why did you personally not do any autopsies on when you saw these things and these questions happening? What do you think that they would say in terms of their response to that? You're muted at the moment, Rory. You're muted at the moment, Rory. Oh, sorry. I think mm -hmm. that they would uh, say that uh, they were either not encouraged to do the autopsies or actively discouraged like we like I was in Vanuatu. But one doctor who who did an autopsy series, um, Professor Arne Burkhardt from Germany, uh, his findings have been very uh, instrumental in understanding, uh, you know, the uh, COVID vaccine reactions. And it's a pity that more pathologists didn't conduct those studies. He actually came out of retirement um, to perform the studies uh, initially just alone. And uh, the 15 autopsies that he did uh, were all classified as natural causes, even though they had died, you know, with, uh, within a short time of, of, of taking a COVID vaccine or booster. They were all classified as natural causes. He came in then to re-examine them 
and uh, you know found some startling findings, mainly related to the vasculature, um, both the small vessels and larger vessels. Um, so yeah, his findings have been instrumental, and it's a it's a pity that more pathologists um, you know didn't add to the numbers. But I think he's continuing. His, his, his initial findings were based on 15 autopsies, very thoroughly examined. Um, but um, yeah, I think his numbers have grown now, and they uh, we're getting a better and p better picture as the numbers grow. One one of the big worries that I have is that I, I think the general public really struggles to understand how these answers can be bypassed. I, I really think, even I struggle to grasp, as I said, when you think about all the countries across the world, and if you imagine that in each region there are a number of pathologists, you are talking about tens of thousands of pathologists. And one of the arguments being put forward is that if there was something that was a concern, absolutely, they would see it. But what you are saying is actually no, because they're not actually looking for it. That mm -hmm. is a frightening situation. And, and, and if we do hit problems in the future, how do we justify that to the public? Any thoughts, Shankara? How would you justify? Because this is a reflection not just on pathologists, this is a reflection on clinicians not insisting on pathologists or not insisting on the system. How do we answer that, Shankara? I think, uh, I think Philip, uh, the entirety of uh, health care has been overregulated. Uh, even with doctors being afraid, afraid to treat uh, from the start. So I think we should uh, have allowed doctors to doctor and pathologists to do what's best for them. I'm sure that there are a lot of pathologists around the world that were inquisitive enough to start an inquiry. But when findings are suppressed, when, uh, when your vocation is threatened, then you decide to not do it. Uh, I think that's where we, we have the biggest problem. Uh, each, uh, each faculty of medicine should have been allowed to perform its, its job with due diligence. Uh, not not cherry pick uh, what we want to see and what we don't want to see. So I think the censorship the uh, uh, has played into that. Uh, everyone's looking out to make sure that they have a stable income and feed their families and don't take risks. Of course, we govern. Uh, we're part of uh, bodies that are councils that govern our ability to practice. And when those councils come out and say, you're not allowed to do this and that, then we, we're forced to follow that. So I think initially it was a little heavy handed from the top down that caused us not to look too closely. Uh, I was willing to take a risk uh, to examine patients, but a lot of the doctors around me were discouraged from seeing patients. I had to go against mainstream to gain the knowledge I have, or to uh, go against the presiding regulatory, uh, let's call it, not, not it wasn't a regulatory uh, control, but more regulatory, uh, uh, let's say that they gave us their opinion as to what we should and shouldn't do. And that opinion got enforced over time more and more strictly. And so people just decided that they didn't want to get involved in that. And that's, that's what stifled our understanding. If yeah. we were left to our own devices, I think our inquisitiveness uh, would have brought the results. Uh, my, my inquisitive nature about the pandemic put my life at risk. But uh, that's that's what being inquisitive is about. So I'm sure there were a lot of people out there inquisitive about looking into this, but we're just subtly discouraged. You know, um, Rory, I'm going to ask you a question. There was a gap in my research when I was looking at um, the early phases of COVID-19. What I started to do was go all the way back to see if we had any pathology on patients who were pre-symptomatic. There are only six autopsies that were done across the world in patients who were pre-COVID that we had histology. What was interesting is that all of them had significant lung inflammation, even though they had no symptoms. And so mm -hmm. I was calling for the fact that we needed to do 
asymptomatic autopsies, meaning that if a patient died in a car accident, they fell off a building and they, they, you test everybody who is COVID-19 positive, if they are positive and had no symptoms, we do an autopsy, even a core biopsy on them. Is that asking too much, Rory? Any, any thoughts on that? No, I don't think that is asking too much. I mean, uh, autopsies are actually mandated where there's any criminal uh, suspicion as part of an inquest. Um, but then they can also be requested um, with the consent of the next of kin. So they can be requested uh, even in asymptomatic cases with the um, with the consent of the next of kin. And, and this, would, uh, this would have been one of those areas where consent should have been sought. Um, well, to, to keep the information. But here's an even more important question that popped into my head, and I, I'm just going to ask you this, Rory. It, currently, autopsies are still being done in the context of patients who have died where there is no clear cause of death. Okay? So these mm. autopsies are still being done across the world. Some yes. of them would be people who had COVID. Some of them could have been people who have had, say, a vaccine injury. Mm. Where are these results and why are they not available for public review? That's really the question. So in a sense, it's mm. not that some have not been done. It's just that yeah. they are not available for public or uh, scientific perusal. Is that about right? Yes, yes. I mean, the, the results may be there, but, um, you know, they haven't been published as part of a series or, you know, journals haven't accepted them for publication or something like that. That that may well have happened. Yeah. But uh, to back up what uh, Dr. Shankara Chetty said in Australia, the Australian Health Professions Regulatory a Agency was very heavy handed and actually issued a, a letter to doctors to warn them that uh, anyone uh, contributing to vaccine hesitancy could be uh, sanctioned severely. Um, so, yeah, so there was some heavy handedness from on high um, with, our, with our doctor's bodies in uh, Australian Health Professions Regulatory Agency, uh, I, I know for a fact. Um, but, um, yeah, um, with regards to the question of why there wasn't more interest in doing autopsies. Um, I think that is a blight on us pathologists. But I mean, I take my hat off to the to the likes of Dr. Shankara Chetty and uh, Professor On Burkhart, who, uh, you know, have contributed so much to our understanding now. Yeah, yeah. These, these are these are important questions. So as we move forward, we still don't know some of the answers. So I'm going to, to share an important question that I asked. And so as we look to the future, because, yep, okay, maybe mistakes were made in the past, but we're still in the middle of a pandemic and we still don't have a full understanding of the disease, which to me after three years, I think is unacceptable. I don't think it's acceptable that we don't have detailed pathological understanding of this disease. So let's just imagine that we're wiping the slate clean. And I'm, I'm now putting the question to you, Rory, being the leader across the world for pathologists, your decision is all that counts. <laughs> so if, 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 if you were... The leader. <laughs> <laughs> so if you were in the position, and so now we need to know the answers for questions. And one of the big questions that I've had is mm -hmm. that, Certainly, when we look towards um, what is happening with vaccines, one of the things that I was noted in the first um, vaccine development with SARS-CoV is that there was type 2 hypersensitivity responses that occurred in the animals. And this is why we never had a SARS-CoV vaccine. The question would be, could we be seeing similar type 2 hypersensitivity responses that are also occurring now. And I can't see any other way that it could be known except by pathology. What should we therefore do going forward? Well, I think uh, we should uh, 
try and organize more autopsies as as dr shankara said this is a novel tech uh, this is a novel technology and uh, any any deaths that are in any way associated with this novel technology should have been better investigated um you know uh, the work of dr arn burkhardt has demonstrated uh you, you know very uh, heavy uh autoimmune type and uh, lymphocyte rich inflammatory reaction particularly in the vessels both small and large but uh you know widespread in a number of tissues including like a hashimoto type thyroiditis and uh you know in the thyroid gland um you know autoimmune type uh, cell adenitis this is in the salivary glands um you know uh, vasculitis involving uh, small vessels in and around the brain um, and, and one technique that he actually, uh, you know, has, uh, I think, pioneered is, is the use of immunohistochemistry in this disease. Now, immunohistochemistry is, a, um, is something we've used in pathology for at least 30 years. We, we use it for diagnosis pr uh, primarily. So if we want to check for, uh, whether a cell is an epithelial cell, for instance, which would make... Uh, you know, which would uh, make a cancer a carcinoma, we would look for cytokeratins um, and we would use this immunohistochemical approach of antibody antigen reaction with a chromogen attached. So we can see a, a brown or a red color or, or some other color wherever that protein is present. Now, Dr. Arndt Burkhardt has used this technology, well known, but he has adapted it for the spike protein. So he can see where the spike protein in, in, in the sections are concentrated using this uh, immunohistochemical technique. Um, and he has also been able to differentiate between um, vaccine-produced spike protein and spike protein resulting from COVID infection because the, the, the spike protein that comes with COVID infection includes a nucleocapsid protein which is not present in, 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 in the vaccine. So where you have only the spike protein present and not the nucleocapsid with the spike protein present, that is an indication that the spike protein is being produced by the vaccine, not the virus. So I think, um, you know, his use of these techniques, which have been used uh, for many years but have now been adapted towards COVID, have been, uh, you know, very beneficial as well. Wow, that is that is that is mind blowing, actually. Uh, any thoughts mm. on that, Shankara? Yes, uh, Philip. Uh, vitally important. <clears throat> uh, what Dr. Burkhardt has shown is that we're dealing with an immunologic issue. Uh, the presence of lymphocytes. He did find mature mast cells at certain sites. He stained for spike protein. Uh, in those, that, that was the controversy initially, that this could have been from COVID infection. And then he stained for nucleocapsid and found it absent in his tissue. And that's how he proved that it was from vaccines alone, uh, seeing that it was only spike protein. The tissue was devoid of nucleocapsid. Uh, now, the, that kind of understanding, uh, with your comment that in uh, SARS-CoV-1, the mice that were given the developed vaccine on rechallenge with the virus developed severe hypersensitivity type pneumonitis, type two kind of uh, reaction. That's vitally important in going forward because we've got a, a large proportion of the planet vaccinated with a vaccine that has been shown to affect you immunologically. And if that in any way primes you to any future infection, best we know about it. Because the future variants of COVID that we're exposed to might be milder, less virulent versions of the virus but present with more severe disease simply because of the immunologic priming caused by a vaccine. And we shouldn't be seeing that as severe illness caused by a virus. That is simply a, an immune response that, has caused, that was caused by a previous vaccination. Now, these kind of things need to be understood so that we direct treatment to the appropriate uh, pathology. We stop trying to uh, kill a virus and start trying to uh, douse an inappropriate immune response. So I think the work of Dr. Burkhardt is vitally important in understanding 
where we might go in the future and to keep a broad view of the probabilities that exist with future severe respiratory illness. You know, it, it's almost frightening, Rory, to consider that we could potentially be identified. And you have to, uh, let me just clarify, my research into COVID-19 has always been the fact that I, I perceive it as a viral mediated autoimmune disease. And so everything I look for is about autoimmune responses. And so therefore, the minute you mention a vasculitis, you know, anything to do with um, a, a, a vascular involvement, in my view, fits perfectly within that framework. But the truth is, the only way that I can see that this can be identified is through pathological examination. I can't see that we would be able to know this by any other source. Am I right on that? It, is, is pathology absolutely central to understanding some of these patterns? Um, well, yes, uh, I think it, it is. You, you, you can get insights um, you know, from drawing blood, from taking biopsies, um, you, you can definitely get insights um, into what's going on. But to get a full picture, I think an autopsy is vital. And, um, you know, with regard to Professor Arndt Burkhardt, his hypothesis is that, uh, you know, the, the body becomes so busy fighting itself with as in like an autoimmune lymphocytic vasculitis, which is very widespread and involves the, you know, the vasa vasorum, for instance, of the, of the aorta. These are the feeder vessels that, you know, supply the outer layers of the aorta. Um, that larger vessels are involved, the myocarditis as well, pericarditis, all these things are a, an autoimmune phenomenon. And because the body is so busy fighting itself, um, there is lost immunity uh, towards fighting um, other infections. So we're seeing, uh, you know, herpes zoster shingles re reactivated, and 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 uh, you know the the immune system is also involved in suppressing cancers. So with the um, you know with the immune system being busy fighting itself, autoimmune some of these cancers are allowed to pr uh, proliferate. That's his hypothesis. And I think it's a good one. Well, it, it, it raises a question though, you know, Shankar, here we are talking about some of the science around this, but are we increasing anxiety in the public without knowing for certain? Should the public know about some of these questions? Is it inappropriate to raise them? I think, uh... Uh, Philip, uh, anxiety comes from the unknown. And once you know, you, you, I guess you plot a way forward. So the public being aware of what the possibilities are will make them a little more astute in uh, picking up uh, symptoms that would go uh, unresolved, un, 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 uh, uh, symptoms that they would ignore in the past, and seek medical advice and medical attention more timelessly. So I don't think we can assume that the, pop the population is best to keep them in the dark. Uh, that's, that's, that's a naive view. Uh, we're an educated population. Uh, looking at my first work, uh, Philip, the first uh, public interview I had uh, where I discussed COVID and the understanding of the path of pathophysiology, the biggest uh, feedback I had was that the understanding removed fear and brought hope. So irrespective of the mistakes we might have made in the past, the acknowledgement of those mistakes and the understanding of what's transpired will give us some insight into how to address them and repair that. And that's, how, that's what's going to bring hope. Uh, people are well aware of the side effects from the vaccine. That cannot be hidden. Uh, the way we take away the prevailing anxiety from that is to show that we are deep in trying to understand it and find solutions to it. Uh, I'm sure uh, the anxiety will come from a sense of abandonment if we as professionals don't acknowledge the vaccine side effects and uh, find ways to actually treat it. So the anxiety would be unwarranted in a, in a situation where treatment's available. Uh, excellent point, Shankara. And, and so Rory, 
um, as we come to the end here now, um, I, I think that one of the things that we do have to, to challenge is generally pathologists, because I think that the future of the pandemic and the things that happen fully lie in the remit of pathologists. If pathologists don't do autopsies, we are absolutely blind. And so the question then becomes, what do we say to pathologists that would make them change their approach to being recognizing that they are central to understanding, helping the clinicians, the scientific community understand the disease? What do they need to hear to make them fight for everyone else? Because this is the point is if they don't fight to make a difference, we are absolutely stuck in the water. You're muted at the moment, by the way, Rory. Uh, yes. Uh, well, I, I, I hope uh, more pathologists will, uh, you know, realize that we sort of missed the ball uh, early on with the lack of autopsies uh, in early COVID and uh, will now realize the vital importance of performing autopsies um, in those who, who die post-vaccinated without any other clear cause of death. Mm. It's vitally important. Absolutely. And Shankara, anything that the, the other rest of the community can do, clinicians? Because as I said, the more that we reflect on it, we, we just need to know the answers. How does the community, the public, insist on this being done? Is there a way for that to happen? Uh, I think, Philip, when uh, when a family member or loved one dies of uh, some un, some 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 unnatural reason, untimely, the family need to probe deeper why why that occurred, not just accept that it was uh, it was some some cause that's written on a death certificate. Uh, a lot of people have been diagnosed with pre-existent heart disease, diabetes, all those kinds of things to justify. Uh, as an untimely death. Uh, so I think family members need to assist with the furthering of scientific understanding by requesting for autopsies, requesting for pathology. After all, the examination of mortal remains is what's going to give us understanding of the cause of illness in the first place and help save lives of those that uh, get infected in the future. So uh, I think... Uh, the public at large needs to assist the medical community in getting the scientific knowledge that we so desperately need. Yeah, wonderful. Listen, um, Rory and Shankara, uh, thank you both for being here. This has been actually very insightful, especially what you've been saying, Rory, about the work um, from Germany. We need more pathologists like this across the world who are insistent on finding answers. And... Um, and we would hope, Shankara, I think this is such an important point that even as a Doctors' Federation for the World, we have to find a way to push this question and bring it to the forefront that this must be done. This is not an optional situation. We have to do these autopsies. We have to get the answers and we have to find a, a way forward. So thank you all very much. And again, at the end, I'm going to highlight our upcoming conference, the Doctors' Federation for the World in, in November. And um, we'll have the outro with that. I'll ask these two gentlemen to wait with me until that's over and I'll have a chat offline. So thank you everyone for watching and look forward to more fascinating, important discussions in the future. Thank you. Thanks, Philip.